It's an honor to welcome all of you today. I'm Sarah Bloomfield, Director of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Our founding chairman, Ellie Wiesel, envisioned the museum as an institution that would speak to the present and the future as much as to the past. He wanted it to do for victims of genocide and mass atrocities today, what was not done for the Jews of Europe during the Holocaust. Today, as we focus on the museum's grave concerns about crimes against humanity and potential genocide against the Uyghur community, we're reminded that more than 75 years after the end of the Holocaust, never again urgently needs to become reality rather than rhetoric. For many years, the Uyghur community, a Muslim minority of approximately 12 million, has been targeted by the Chinese government's policy of forcible assimilation. This was done most visibly through prohibitions on Uyghur religion and culture, including the destruction of related heritage sites. However, in recent years, we have strong evidence that the policy of forced assimilation has escalated to a policy of mass detention with an estimated one to three million people detained and efforts to control birth rates. Leaked Chinese government documents suggest that ordinary acts such as praying or traveling out of the country can lead to detention. Former detainees talk of political indoctrination, torture, and even deaths in custody. There are reports of forced sterilization and forced intrauterine device placement. We at the museum are gravely concerned that Chinese government may be committing genocide against the Uyghurs. The seriousness of the systematic assault on this community demands the immediate response of the international community to protect the victims. The future of a people may depend on swift, decisive action by global actors. And no one understands the urgency of responding to such crimes as does our next guest, Ray Goldfarb, a Holocaust survivor. We are honored that Ray is with us today to share her story, which should spark all of us to redouble our work to prevent genocide. We are also joined by members of the Uyghur community who have been courageously doing the necessary and dangerous work of uncovering the crimes against them and telling the world. We will also hear from leaders in Congress who've been working tirelessly to hold the Chinese government to account for its crimes against the Uyghurs. Special thanks to all of them for joining us for this important conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for your remarks. And thank you to our audience for joining us today to discuss the persecution of the Uyghur community in China. Our museum stands as a reminder that how we confront mass atrocities can send a message to persecuted groups around the world, as well as potential perpetrators. It's also a reminder of the dangers of insufficient action to protect groups at risk. Today, we are releasing a new report that outlines our grave concerns that the Chinese government may be committing genocide against the Uyghurs, a Muslim community in Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region of Northwest China. We have stated previously and reaffirmed today that crimes against humanity are being committed with impunity by the Chinese government. These crimes include persecution, imprisonment, forced sterilization, sexual violence, enslavement, torture, and forcible transfer. The Chinese government's assault on the Uyghur community is alarming in scale and severity. Between one and three million people, mostly Uyghurs, have been detained in a system where survivors share horrific stories of abuse. The government's crimes are also marked by a deepening assault on weaker female reproductive capacity through forced sterilization and forced intrauterine device placement. The Uyghur population is currently experiencing some of the most serious crimes known to humankind. The trauma inflicted from these atrocities will harm generations of Uyghurs. Today, I'm joined by a group of esteemed colleagues and experts to address the current threats faced by Uyghurs in Xinjiang and to discuss what can be done to halt these crimes and hold the perpetrators of these mass atrocity crimes accountable for their actions. 
These crimes are a failure of the world's commitment to never again. When we reflect on crimes of this magnitude, the impact on the individual can be too easily lost. At this time, I welcome remarks from Ray Goldfarb, a Holocaust survivor and museum volunteer who will share her own harrowing story of escaping the Nazis. She is one of the few survivors of her village. Her experience and the work she does today to prevent mass atrocities from happening to others should be a call to action for all of us. My name is Rachel Goldfarb. I'm a Holocaust survivor and a museum volunteer. I was born on December 2nd, 1930 in Dokszycy, Poland, a small town close to the Polish-Soviet border. When World War II began in September 1939, the Soviet Union, in an agreement with Nazi Germany, occupied half of Poland, including my hometown. Life changed considerably because the communist regime did not permit private businesses. And my late father's meat and produce business and my mother's thriving fabric store were confiscated. After Germany went to war with the Soviet Union in July 1941, the Nazis occupied Dokshitsi and life became even more difficult. Immediately, discriminatory laws were enacted. Jews were required to sew a yellow Jewish star on all their clothing so that we would be visible at all times. Schools were closed to Jewish children, my youngest brother Shlomo and I could no longer attend school. In November, an edict was issued instructing all Jews to assemble in the marketplace with all their belongings they could carry after which they were moved into a newly established ghetto. Fortunately, our family home was already within the perimeter of the ghetto so that we were able to reside in our house However, we had now to share our home with many others. The ghetto, which was heavily guarded, only allowed those who performed forced labor to leave. An underground movement helped some men to escape from their work details. When the Nazis discovered they were missing, they forced the ghetto elders to select 10 men for each escapee and executed them in front of the population. Between March and June 1942, two mass executions of Jews took place in our town. That summer, the remaining Jews were ordered to gather in the ghetto square to be counted. We were aware of the previous mass, ex mass executions, which prompted us to go into hiding. Our hiding place, constructed years earlier by my grandfather, was located between a false wall in our house and attached warehouse. For eight or nine days, we remained hidden in this tiny space with little food or water, while the Nazis and their collaborators searched for Jews and looted our home. My mother, brother, and I escaped the ghetto with the help of my maternal grandmother, who sacrificed herself so that we could flee. Eventually, we, re we reached a neighboring village where the three of us were hidden by different farmers. Word got to us that my brother's hiding place had been exposed and that we had, he had been taken away. We later learned that he had been executed. The Gentiles no longer felt safe harboring us. So mother and I left with the hope of sneaking into a nearby Glenbocky ghetto. We wandered from village to village, hiding in cornfields by day and walking at night, relying on friendly farmers to provide food and clothing, and sometimes a place to lay our heads. Finally, we made it to Glenbocky and entered the ghetto among the crowds of Jews returning from their work details. Initially, we stayed with family and friends in Glenbocky, but escaped when we were assigned to perform forced labor outside the ghetto walls. Through mother's resourcefulness and bravery, we found a group of partisans that were operating from the surrounding forests. Mother became their cook and I her helper. Expecting the partisans to be effective against the Germans, the Soviets supplied the group from the air beginning in 1943. 
In February 1944, I got very sick with typhus. We moved deeper into the forest to a makeshift hospital. During the German retreat in spring of 1944, the partisans dispersed and tried to blend into the general population to avoid capture. After an incredibly close encounter with the Nazis, we wandered from village to village until we found a partisan group that had reformed. We were liberated in the, by the Soviet army in the summer of 1944. However, we were still not safe. The local population remained hostile toward Jews and we had to flee again. Mother was able to find work with the Soviet army, repairing water towers along the rail lines. We lived in a boxcar attached to the work train and traveled behind the front lines. When it became too dangerous, we left the train behind and connected with other survivors in Lublin. With the help of Jewish organizations, we were able to get to Italy, the American zone, where we lived in displaced persons camps for two years before immigrating to the United States in 1947. Of the several thousand Jews in our town, only about two dozen survived. As a survivor of the Holocaust, I feel obligated to speak of my experiences, to honor the memory of those who perished and to prevent atrocities like the Holocaust from occurring again. It is imperative that we speak out about persecution before it's too late so that others do not have to endure the losses we did. This is why I'm so proud to work and to work with the museum Simon, Simon Scott Center for Prevention of Genocide and call attention to persecution of the Uyghurs in China. We must all work to fulfill the promise, never again. Thank you. Thank you, Ray, for sharing your moving and painful experience with us and reminding us of the critical and solemn work ahead to prevent genocide and protect communities at risk. At this time, it is my honor to introduce Senator Marco Rubio and Representative Jim McGovern. Both Senator Rubio and Representative McGovern have been tireless advocates for the Uyghur people and have worked to halt the Chinese government's campaign against multiple groups. Both are serving or have served as co-chairs of the Congressional Executive Commission on China, and both have led efforts to pass the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act in Congress. Hello, I'm Marco Rubio, and I'm incredibly grateful for the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. It's a museum that I think we all wish did not need to exist, but it does. And today you play an incredibly important role in reminding the world that millions of innocent people were slaughtered and abused at the hands of wicked oppressors. But you're also warning that genocide is not simply something in the history books. It's happening right now. You know, at this very moment, the Chinese Communist Party is engaged in a systematic campaign to erase the Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities in Xinjiang. Sterilization, internment camps, slave labor, and other atrocities. And unwittingly, many of us are complicit because the clothes we wear, the batteries we use, the solar panels we install are a product of slave labor. Silence is not an option. We must raise our voices, rally governments and corporations alike, and stop this ongoing genocide. May God bless you in all your efforts to make the world a better and safer place. Hi, I'm Congressman Jim McGovern from Massachusetts. As co-chair of both the Congressional Executive Commission on China and the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission, I have a unique position in working to promote international human rights law as a fundamental basis for relations between nations and peoples. As many of you know, this body of international law was born out of the horrors of World War II and the Holocaust. I deeply value the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum's mission to ensure that this greatest of crimes is never erased from memory. And I welcome the work of the Simon Scott Center for the Prevention of Genocide to apply these lessons to the present and the future. Because sadly, humanity has not moved beyond its ability to inflict terrible, awful crimes on itself. We see this today in the Xinjiang region of the People's Republic of China. People of Turkic heritage and predominantly Muslim faith have lived there for, for centuries. Uyghurs, Kazakhs, and others call this home. 
And this is what the government of China sees as a threat. Our commission has documented repression against the Uyghurs for two decades as authorities escalated to the detention camps and forced labor transfer as we witnessed today. It is a campaign to totally erase from the earth the culture, identity, religion, and the lives of a distinct community of people. This is crimes against humanity. The State Department calls it a genocide. Whatever the label, our morality and our law demand that we act. Congress passed the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act and the administration has sanctioned Chinese officials complicit in the abuses. We are working to pass my bill, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, to stop the import of products made by forced labor. The executive branch has already banned the import of cotton and tomatoes from Xinjiang. We also seek to pass legislation to provide a humanitarian pathway for Uyghurs and others fleeing persecution to come to the United States. Our commission held a hearing on this last month featuring the personal story of Tahir Hamoud Isgul. And we must ensure that our national security policies do not give license to the Chinese government to disguise its repression of Uyghurs as a counter-terrorism policy. The museum is playing an invaluable role in raising awareness and advancing policy. Your new report will provide a comprehensive legal analysis of the crimes against humanity in Xinjiang. And I look forward to reviewing, reviewing its recommendations for a strong United States and international response. Again, I thank the museum and the center for their leadership and their work to end crimes against humanity in China and around the world. Thank you, Senator Rubio and Representative McGovern for your remarks, as well as your longstanding support of the weaker people and for atrocity prevention. It is now my sincere honor to introduce Dolkin Issa, the president of the World Uyghur Congress. My name is Dolkin Issa, president of the World Uyghur Congress. For almost 20 years, the World Uyghur Congress has worked around the clock to raise awareness of the systematic repression that the Uyghurs have historically endured at the hands of the successive Chinese governments. While most of the world was watching in silence the early forms of violence and the repression of the Uyghur people in Uzbekistan set a precedence for current ongoing genocide to unfold. The world never again voiced by founders of the United Nations in 1945 and embodied in Universal Declaration of Human Rights in pilot a moral commitment to prevent atrocity like the Holocaust from happening again. The United States has been one of the countries that have taken this commitment seriously. In January of this year, it has officially recognized the Uyghur genocide and has taken meaningful action to end Chinese crime, such as import bans on the products made by Uyghur forced labor. Besides statements and action from national governments and international institutions, other groups facing repression in China, as well as religious community, are crucial allies in this fight against the Uyghur genocide. In our effort to end the suffering of our people, the support of the Yevish community has been of great importance to us. In this slide, we would like to thank U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum's Simon Scott Center for Prevention of the Genocide for addressing this issue. The many messages of the solidarity we have received strengthen us and give us hope in our own pursuit to give justice to victims of the Uyghur genocide. Creating a better world Start with the voice of the each one of us being raised, and it is in the shared interest of all of human, humanity that we continue doing so. It is now my pleasure to introduce members of our expert panel. Gulchera Hoja is a Uyghur journalist with Radio Free Asia. Previously in Xinjiang, she hosted a TV show for Uyghur children. Sadly, approximately two dozen of her family members have been detained in Xinjiang. Thank you, Gulchera, for bravely continuing your important work. Eben Osnos is an author and journalist and staff writer with The New Yorker. He was based in Beijing for eight years and has written extensively about the political, 
economic, and social landscape in China. He has also written powerfully about his own family's escape from the Holocaust. Sarita Ashraf is a legal fellow with the museum Simon Scott Center for the Prevention of Genocide and is a barrister specialized in international criminal law with expertise in the gender commission and impact of international crimes. She has worked on UN investigations of ISIL crimes against the Yazidis in Northern Iraq, which culminated in findings that ISIL committed genocide and crimes against humanity. Thank you all for joining us for this incredibly important discussion today. Before we dive into the findings, let's take a step back and talk about how we got here. We often hear about what has happened to the Uyghurs in Xinjiang in the past four years, but the Uyghurs have faced discrimination and exclusion for much longer. Gulchera, could you share with us some information about the long history of persecution against the Uyghur community? And why do you think that the Chinese government has done this? <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, it's my honor to be joined uh, with you in this uh, very important meeting. Yeah, <clears throat> I am grown up in Urumqi. Uh, in our time, it's a little bit of a gap for we can access to our, learn our language and a little bit of our history. And also we can, um, not openly, but at home, we can practice our uh, religion. Um, so in my age or after me, like 10 years younger, uh, those generation all knows uh, who they are. So we know our identity is very different from the uh, Chinese. That's why <clears throat> China government seeing us as a threat. So when I graduate to start in Xinjiang TV work for the Uyghur children, <clears throat> also we use that uh, opportunity to teach our children, our language, our culture, uh, and uh, basically who we are. <clears throat> so it was in 2000, early 2000. And then um, I escaped China to US in 2001. Uh, because of that time in uh, 98, 1998 to 2000, Chinese government uh, using the bilingual education uh, to estimate we were children much more than before. So they pushed that policy very, very harshly to the old school system. And they also uh, forcing us for uh, the Uyghur program because our TV program for the Uyghur language, Uyghur uh, kids. So they uh, demand us to use our children program to promoting uh, and propaganda about the Chinese education, how um, will bring more bright future to the Uyghur kids. They said bilingual education, but it's like only pure Han Chinese education. So that time we all saw what is going on and the, what is Chinese government's goal. That's why I don't want to um, use my uh, TV show to propaganda to our children, our family. Uh, so I give up everything I achieve and I came to United States join uh, Radio Free Asia because Radio Free Asia is the only uh, outlet for uh, Uyghurs to learn what's happening to the war uh, uh, in the world and the Uyghurs. So I start working there, but 2000 <clears throat> after uh, they put the, one of the non unknown organization to the uh, terror list, terrorist organization list, a Chinese government using this just turn, you know, uh, have a good reason to crack down on Uyghurs. Uh, they just seeing anybody who have faith, who have nationalism or who have not assimilate enough, not Han Chinese enough, they seeing them all like um, enemies. So we saw this uh, politics uh, like decade. So after uh, 2016, Chinese government start to mass, you know, uh, building those uh, 
camps. Uh, in the beginning, they said it's a re-education camp. And then they, they didn't, uh, you know, they, they denied they have camps. They said, <coughs> this is, <coughs> I'm sorry, those are the uh, re-education center for who have uh, terrorist idea or who have extremist idea. Uh, what is it? Uh, the, who are those people? Are is who exposed to their history, their language, and who uh, crossed uh, abroad to see what is freedom? <laughs> who have relatives uh, uh, on abroad, and who studying coming from other country? Even if they have access some uh, website and who have uh, you know religion websites and also old Uyghur language teachers, uh, including all the uh, Uyghur journals family members, all run up in the camp in 2017. In beginning, uh, the Uyghur journals was the first who um, open up this issue to the world. And because of our language and we all grown up in Uyghur region, we know uh, the situation there and the politics there. So much easier for us to access. Even we cannot personally go there, but we use phone uh, interview so many officials, Uyghurs here. So we find out there's a big crackdown and a re-education camp and et cetera. And then we uh, interview so many uh, camp uh, survivors also. They bring us a very solid information what is going on on those camps. And approximately we saying uh, 1.8 million people in those camps, but it was 2018 we starting using this number. But as we know, those camps are still, you know, expanding and people still, uh, you know, getting arrested. So we believe uh, right now the number is much uh, higher than that. But uh, as you know, even Chinese government doesn't let UN or the international, uh, you know, investigator to go there to check out what's happening. So in this case, we only rely uh, you know, our information and other experts' information. So we believe it's like 1.8 to 3 million people still in the camp, including my family members, uh, because I was focusing on that issue from the beginning. That's why Chinese government wants to silence me and my colleagues too. Uh, <clears throat> so they put my uh, first, at first, my brother in 2017, September, they arrest my brother and uh, telling my mom because of me, they arrest my brother. But that time that one, my mom doesn't want me to speak out because she was afraid they will kill him. And just uh, says, please wait, wait, they will, they will, because he didn't do anything. My mom still was you know, <clears throat> hoping they have, you know, law. <laughs> so yeah. we, we were waiting, but uh, never happened. And then after a few months, all my uh, direct family members all gone. I learned okay. in 2018, um, beginning of, uh, you know, end of January, they, they uh, arrested my mom and my other, 23 uh, relatives, including my aunts and my cousins and their wives all together from two cities, one night. The, um, so after she gone, and um, that time my father was in intensive care because of half of the body cannot move. Um, so we were so afraid. And uh, in the last minute, when you, you know, lost everything. So you don't have fear. So I stood up, I start to uh, telling my own story to the media and uh, telling a story about other Uyghurs. And we did more. And uh, we find out in the camps, there's torture, um, starvation, 
um, even death. Uh, we recently, we learned even sexual abuses uh, happening there. So when you yeah, yeah. when you work on those issue, of course we are human. We immediately think think about you know our family members when you interview. Even during my work, when I interview those uh, camp survivors, when they telling me what they were experiencing in the cell, I immediately um, think about my mother, my sisters, my brothers, of course. It's hard, hard, um, but- Cultura, it, it must be so incredibly painful and difficult uh, for you to day in, day out, not know what's happening to your family, but also, as you said, work to try to tell their story. And you know, you've in such a powerful way highlighted how what started as a very deliberate strategy of forcible assimilation, mm -hmm. of trying to destroy and erode the Uyghur community, the culture, the identity. Yes. Uh, and that because that's been our done. Identity. Mm -hmm. Exactly, the targeting based on your identity and the justification uh, flawed and completely um, almost when we think about from a, a legal perspective, as Sarita will get to um, the articulation of threats of, of terrorism and allegations along, that, along those lines that have been used to uh, justify erroneously uh, the mm -hmm imprisonment of, as you said, up to 3 million people. It's an incredibly devastating and horrific situation. You know, Evan, as we look at what's been happening, we've seen a pretty drastic shift in the way the Chinese government is approaching Xinjiang. Uh, as an institution, we're concerned that they've shifted from a policy of forcible assimilation to something possibly more sinister. And the government has approached this kind of ruthless campaign against the Uyghurs and they've done at the same time as they've been seeking to spread their influence, including globally uh, throughout the continent and beyond with infrastructure projects like the Belt and Road Initiative that runs from Asia and Europe. How does the deepening assault on the Uyghur community relate to the Chinese Communist Party's broader ambitions? Yeah, thank you, Naomi. And uh, most of all, thank you to Golchera for that very powerful testimony, that description in um, just unforgettable terms about what it has meant to your family. And uh, um, so I take that with me today. I think um, to your point, that Naomi, there has been this uh, period of, in a sense, these dual facts, big facts of our time. One fact is that China has been growing as a feature of international affairs. It has been gaining power and influence and capacity and voice in international institutions. And at the same time, it has been escalating this campaign against Muslims in China and particularly the Uyghur population as we've heard about today. And these two are related in a sense because uh, for a couple of reasons that I think are worth identifying. One is when we think about why it is that the Chinese government has undertaken this policy, um, to your question a moment ago, Naomi, I think um, you have to situate it in the context of the Communist Party's sense of risk and fragility that goes back to its perception of the downfall of the Soviet Union. As you know, they are, you know, the, the, the government in Beijing talks a lot about why the Soviet Union collapsed. It's, it's sort of an, an organizing principle of how it makes decisions. And even before the most recent escalation and persecution of Uyghurs in China, there was writing in Chinese academic circles about how they had to be mindful of the experience of how the Soviets, as they put it, lost control of their ethnic minorities and lost control of territory. And that once that happened, then they lost control of their political project. And that idea is really in, I think, kind of looming in the background of a lot of the political um, discussion that goes on. And then of course you have to combine it with other elements, which 
we can talk about in more detail as people want to, but um, perceptions of the specific role of the Han majority in China and the way that they are interpreting that and, and using that as a justification for these kinds of abuses. And, um, but I would add one other thing, which is that the reason why this campaign has kind of moved up, I think this stairway of abuses as we've seen over the last few years becoming more and more um, severe and as described in the report, uh, has now uh, reached a new level of alarm that is generating international attention here in Washington and in other places. But part of the reason why it has gone on and has continued to intensify is precisely because so much of the world has remained silent. And I think you can't, you can't uh, interpret that any other way than a reflection of the fact that China's growing political and economic might has made it easier to blunt the criticism that they might have received or they might receive if they weren't in a position um, of power. And so it, in a sense, raises, I think, the, the necessity of this kind of report and the work that the museum and the center are doing in terms of focusing attention on this because um, China is in a position to use its, its, its throw weight to try to prevent broader discussion, and there aren't all that many places that can respond with seriousness and precision and, um, and legal expertise, and uh, this is a moment for that. So I'll, I'll leave it there and, um, and turn it back to the rest of the panel for further discussion, uh, but uh, thank you for, um, for allowing me to be a part of it today. No, thank you so much for that, Evan. You know, it, it is terrifying to see just how devastating the crimes are, what the impacts are on families, as Gulchiri mentioned. And as Evan, you noted that the Chinese government is able to shield themselves from, from criticism uh, and is able to manipulate um, through its international engagement and investments, uh, the responses of governments. So we're in a situation where, you know, we want to be um, urging governments to remember their commitment to never again yet we are on a daily basis confronted often with far too much silence in the face of these horrific crimes. And Sarita, that brings me to some of your work and analysis. We're looking at a situation in which we believe that uh, large scale crimes against humanity are being committed in this report. We have actually expanded the number of crimes uh, that we believe are occurring. We've also articulated that we are gravely concerned that the Chinese government may be committing genocide against the Uyghurs. And you know, it's a situation where it's perhaps a bit unique, especially when we think about genocide, but also some of the crimes, when we think of crimes against humanity, where mass killing is not a prominent feature of the attack. And the assault on the Uyghurs' reproductive capacity, uh, that's a key feature of some of our legal analysis around the crimes. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how we should understand the state policy regarding Uyghur birth rates, what should we consider when we're thinking about the crimes being committed against the Uyghur community from a gendered perspective? Thank you, Naomi. It's a pleasure to be on this panel today. Um, you're asking a very good question. As you said, um, often uh, where mass killings are not a prominent feature of international crimes, it can be difficult to, for, to understand and recognize them. Um, often when we're speaking about recognition of international crimes and about gender, it starts, starts from a start, it, the starting point is that um, we, rec we most easily recognize crimes that are committed against those who are considered the most valuable and who are the most visible in our society. That means that crimes who are against adult men tend to be most easily recognized. They're certainly the most easily admitted into the canon of genocidal violence. The flip side of that is, of course, there are communities which are generally rendered less visible in daily life. And so they are also less visible um, often in the investigation, documentation, and potentially prosecution, and even just general discussion of international crimes. That includes women, children, people of color, indigenous communities, um, and so on. Um, or in that case, the crimes against them are, if they're not ignored, they're viewed very reductively. So crimes against women are often reduced to 
to, to simply crimes of sexual violence. Beyond that, those crimes against marginalized groups are often not analyzed as part of the overall architecture of the crimes. We don't ask ourselves, how has this particular crime committed against this woman or this child? How does that fit into the broader, um, understand, our broader understanding of the roles that these crimes play in reaching, in, in reaching particular objectives or in implementing particular strategies? Um, gender permeates uh, the crime of genocide in particular. It's woven into how the crime is planned, into how it is, into the commission of coordinated acts that make up often the continuum of genocidal violence. And it's also the way in which perpetrators can maximize the crime's destructive effect on protective groups. Now, this, this manifests in two ways. First, uh, in the fixation on mass killings. Um, uh, rather than necessarily uh, attacks on the regenerative capacity of the group, and in particular on female reproductive capacity, um, and then on looking at, uh, under genocidal intent, the intent to physically destroy, rather than necessarily the intent to biologically destroy the group. So I'll bring it back uh, after that brief journey into, into law, into the question of how does this feed into our understanding of what's happening in Xinjiang, and particularly with regard to Uyghur birth rates, which has, um, again, kind of been a, a kind of focus of some of the, uh, a lot of the discussion around what's happening in, to the Uyghur community in Xinjiang. Um, I do want to emphasize at the beginning that the discussion of genocide, although it has been uh, the, the discussion of the um, um, coercive measures to uh, bring down drastically reduce weaker birth rates has occupied the main stage. I do want to flag that we're also looking at the separation of the sexes. It's not simply a discussion oh. about measures. It's also about ensuring that weaker men and weaker women are actually unable to live a family life where they can have a family, give birth to children, raise those children within the Uyghur community. And that's being implemented through a variety of ways, including through the mass incarceration of the Uyghur community, predominantly the Uyghur community, also the use of forced labor transfers, which are separating um, men and women from each other, making it harder for the group to regenerate. Um, when it comes to the Uyghur birth rates, the attack on Uyghur reproductive capacity in here, specifically female reproductive capacity, we see a real difference. And in the report, um, we examine that difference uh, in terms of pre-2007 and post-2007. Uh, pre-2017, pre prior to 2017, we see that there had been these incentivizing using caste incentives to have Uyghur communities and other minority communities have, have, have uh, fewer births. Um, post-2017, we see a much more coercive approach to reducing birth, including the leveraging of fines, the, um, the detention and incarceration for people who have been given births. The violation of the, the Chinese government's birth policies had been listed as a major driver of mass incarceration in Xinjiang. Um, we've also seen the number of sterilizations carried out on women across China plummet, with the exception of Xinjiang. Um, and in 2018, uh, one documentation group recorded that 80% of um, the rate of sterilizations in Xinjiang was eight, over eight times that of the rest of China. Um, the focus on Chinese government's focus on the Uyghur birth rates has to be placed in the context of the overall persecutory nature of the violations persecuted by the Chinese government against the Uyghurs of Xinjiang, um, uh, <laughs> against the Uyghurs of Xinjiang. So it's not simply understanding how the, what that, why there has been this um, assault on Uyghur birth rates, it's also understanding how that fits in overall with the treatment of, uh, of, of Uyghurs by the Chinese government and how it threads together into a coordinated strategy in, in tackling uh, in, in, in its uh, treatment of the Uyghurs. Thank you so much, Rasrita. I think, you know, if we just kind of summarize, the key point is our conception and understanding of genocide is evolving as perpetrators change their tactics to achieve their goals, which is destroy uh, a people. And in this particular case, we're seeing a very intentional uh, strategy of targeting in particular women and their ability to have children. And that causes a grave amount of concern for us about the potential for genocide as you've articulated. Can you just very quickly speak to one of the points that Golchera mentioned? The Chinese Communist Party asserts that uh, its actions including mass detention of up to 3 million people, including forced sterilization, uh, is part of anti-terror efforts. 
from your perspective, what, what do you make of that argument? So the Chinese government's decades long repression of the Uyghurs of Xinjiang has been linked by multiple and often mutually reinforcing beliefs. The first is that the Uyghurs are a threat to the security of the Chinese nation. Uh, in the post September September 11th uh, world, we've seen that we saw the co-opting of the the language of the war on terror with all its undercurrents of Islamophobia, as uh, as justifying the targeting of an entire Uyghur population. Um, and it, it indicates that it's not necessarily uh, a particular threat, but rather the entire um, uh, population of Uyghurs with their very distinct um, religion and culture that has been three received perceived as a threat. Um, uh, and so, and so the argument that uh, that this is a anti-terror uh, uh, strategy does not does not truly hold water. As it is not an attack against. Uh, specific groups of concern. It's not an attack against people who are being shown to um, uh, to be, to pose uh, an actual threat against the state. Rather, is an attack on an, an entire community, um, millions of people. Um, at the bedrock of those beliefs, all of those beliefs uh, uh, concerning the Uyghurs is is an according of less inherent value to the Uyghur community uh, above the Han Chinese community. The devaluation of the Uyghurs, the consistent dehumanization and increasing dehumanization of the Uyghurs and the privileging of Han, the Han Chinese community and culture have really led to an in growing entrenchment of, of what I would call supremacist uh, beliefs and the marginalization and dehumanization of minority groups, notably the Uyghurs. Um, this has opened the door to the commission of crimes against humanity and potentially also the commission of genocide. One thing that I would note when it comes to it talking about the birth rates, those have generally not been uh, the, the reduction in birth rates so in, in the weaker community. That has generally not been justified by as being an anti-terror measure. Rather, the Chinese government does not dispute the, uh, the birth rate reductions um, or, um, or agree that it is instituting a policy or that it, it is not instituting a policy of uh, AD implantation sterilization. But they have said that they, uh, that those who complied with family the family planning policies it has do so voluntarily. Um, that, however, I would the, these policies have to be considered within the coercive, oppressive context that exists in Xinjiang, and particularly the threat of detention and consequent family separations. The disproportionate and significant birth reductions in the Uyghur minority areas suggest that this is targeting the Uyghur, Uyghur, Uyghur community specifically. Um, China is also facing extremely a uh, population crisis due to low birth rates. So the, its aggressive efforts to substantially reduce the Uyghur and other minority communities are distinctly out of step with national policy, national policy and concerns. So as you're saying, you know, this hardly looks like a voluntary situation. It's very much coercive. Uh, and similarly, in regards to the justification, um, multiple different iterations of justification that clearly just is not actually um, holding up in terms of uh, what's actually happening in the world. Very briefly, when we talk about the, the crimes that may be occurring and the ongoing risk, states have a, a duty to prevent genocide. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what that means in terms of the Chinese state's obligations here and other governments as well. Sure, yes, thank you. Um, the Genocide Convention um, has within it uh, that states have a duty to prevent uh, the crime of genocide. Within the jurisprudence surrounding, uh, surrounding um, the duty to prevent, um, it's recognized that that is an obligation that is binding on all states, not simply where the genocide um, is said to be occurring or where there is a serious risk to genocide a serious risk of genocide occurring. I prefer actually to phrase it always as the duty to prevent and suppress. Um, and that's because it's a duty that comes into being um, uh, at a point in time when there is a serious risk of genocide occurring, but that duty is also recognized to continue even when a genocide is in progress. Um, the duty lies most heavily on, on the state where crimes are occurring or states which have um, uh, the ability to affect, um, to affect conduct. So it's not a legal obligation, which is one of result. It's very much the one of, one of um, conduct. Um, for the Chinese government, that means that they are 
um, they have a duty to prevent genocide and suppress genocidal action in, in genocidal acts in their uh, in their territory. Um, we're not seeing any recognition, and you have seen this in, in in the reaction of the Chinese government to various states either indicating uh, that uh, genocide may be occurring or that there's a risk of genocide there. We're not seeing risk of genocide occurring in Xinjiang. Um, we haven't seen uh, a positive concern from the Chinese government nor any steps that it would be it would take to prevent genocide occurring. The genocide, that duty to prevent genocide also um, is binding on all states, um, all states in the world, although most heavily on those that can um, can and whose actions can have um, consequences on the conduct in the region. Um, that means all states should be asking themselves, uh, should be concerned with what's happening in Xinjiang, should be carefully following um, the any, not any notifications, any um, explicit references to a serious concern, serious that there's a serious risk of genocide occurring or that a genocide may already be in progress and asking themselves, are they abiding by that duty to prevent? Thank you so much for that, Sarita. You know, just as you're saying, there can be no question as to the responsibility of the Chinese government to prevent the commission of genocide. Uh, and similarly for the international community to take steps to ensure that the Chinese government is not committing these acts. And as you said, it's not that there needs to be um, the actual uh, result achieved in terms of the actions of the international community, but a bare minimum, they need to be taking concrete steps to stop or try to stop these crimes, to shed light on them, to ensure that there is a future accountability. So thank you for that. Gulchura, we only know about these crimes because of the work of you and others who have gone to great lengths and also um, put your own lives in danger to tell the stories of the weaker community. The Chinese Communist Party is using uh, technology on a massive scale to surveil the population, to create a pipeline of people to be detained uh, and face other abuses. And they have been doing that while restricting all access to independent monitors, to journalists, um, to others, to the detention centers and to Xinjiang really more broadly. And we know from past cases uh, that perpetrators go to great lengths to try to hide their crimes. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what it's like to try to gather information in this particular case. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you so much for asking me this question. Uh, as you know, um, Chinese government are very professional on that, you know, the, how to hide their crime. So we see in the past when they massacre uh, the, the Falun Gongs, also a crackdown in Tibet and the Hong Kong also and us. So basically Chinese government wants to silence not only us, silence a uh, whole world by using their power, uh, by using their technology and their money, of course, business. So in this case, only simply recognize uh, what Chinese government doing in Xinjiang uh, as uh, East Turkestan as uh, genocide is not enough to stop this crime. So we need conquer action uh, to be taken by international uh, community, I think. So we saw uh, the American government's uh, sanction is very effective. Um, and um, yeah, we hope uh, the whole international uh, community could do something more stronger to stop this uh, before too late. We saw a few days ago, 43 country uh, from the UN uh, already stood up for against a Chinese government uh, genocide or uh, crime against uh, humanity. Uh, so we have hope, but they using Chinese government using their, you know, any uh, available tools to harass Uyghurs outside even. Uh, the, even they put my name in some kind of terror list, wanted list as a terror suspect. And uh, of course, uh, none basis. Uh, they didn't give any specific uh, why, what I did. And uh, even they put my 
father on that list. So, but I learned that from this year, May, until now, I didn't hear any voice from, you know, American government or international, you know, uh, only the human rights uh, organization was, you know, again, uh, condemned China uh, to put me uh, as a 20 years experienced US journalist and the US citizen to this list baselessly. So, but I didn't hear from the American government uh, say anything direct to the Chinese government because they they announce on their national TV and they they force my brother and mother to speak against me, denounce me. So of course they want to silence me, but as you see, I'm not silenced. Uh, I'm gonna continue my work and what uh, I was doing. So all our uh, other, my uh, co-workers, my uh, journalist friend, all will continue our um, job to, you know, to prevent, uh, to find out more, more uh, evidence of this uh, Chinese government is committing uh, genocide against humanity, but it's not, I feel like not enough, not strong enough yeah. because Five years we've been talking about the same situation still going on and still people missing and especially kids. You know, we, we were talking about <clears throat> grown up people, uh, but even the kids who uh, parents are both uh, end up uh, in the camp, they even put the kids on their own camp. Uh, they brainwash those kids also it's my biggest worry uh, about the next generation, what kind of life waiting for them, for us actually. Uh, so I don't know uh, what uh, some, you know, international community or country waiting for, uh, because we have all solid information. We have so many, uh, even the Chinese, uh, police also was, you know, speaking to the media recently. Uh, he yeah. was working as a, you know, a policeman in there. And he gives very specific information what Chinese government uh, doing in the, those so-called re-education camp. Uh, so the, so please, I uh, ask, uh, whole uh, international community um, break silence, whatever um, it's because of interest, because of uh, other things. So, because this is not only we were, uh, you know, facing this kind of human rights uh, issue and the hu uh, crime against um, humanity. Also, there's Chinese people and uh -huh. other. Uh, minorities as well. And this is not about Uyghur tragedy, this is a human tragedy. So we all should stand up. Thank you so much for that, Gulchera. It's an incredibly powerful and clear call to action for the international community to remember uh, the humanity that we have all committed to, to protect. Uh, with what you were saying, and you were talking a lot about just the intimidation that you and other Uyghurs abroad have faced, the harassment, mm -hmm. that when you use your voice, your family uh, is targeted. And we've seen so often, unfortunately, Uyghurs sharing their stories, and then their family members are arrested, detained, disappeared. We've also seen the lengths at which the Chinese government goes to try to restrict people from actually being able to go to areas where we believe crimes are occurring within Xinjiang. But as you noted, there's a lot of information and evidence, both from individuals who have uh, been released and have left and fled the country. There's been satellite imagery that shows the uh, location and the number of various detention centers. There is information that is publicly available that speaks to the enormity of the crimes that are occurring. 
So this isn't a situation where we can say we did not know. We might not have all of the specifics, but as you've noted, there is enough information and you and others have taken great risks to make sure that the world is aware. Evan, in, in this situation, where as you noted at the, the outset, we have a government that is a superpower committing these types of crimes. And where to date, though there has been references internationally, including by the US government and others to the commission of genocide against the Uyghur community, we haven't really seen efforts taken though to actually prevent genocide. Uh, it hasn't been a core kind of foreign policy priority. And in part, that's due to some of the challenges that you know confronting China um, presents. With all of those realities, what can be done in your mind to change China's behavior? And in particular, are there other actors, including private enterprise uh, and even individuals that have a role to play? I think one of the things <clears throat> that we're beginning to see here in Washington, as a journalist, I've seen um, a change in the temperature of the conversation about this subject, about Xinjiang, about um, the uh, about the conduct of the Chinese government, about the um, international legal context, and Sarita has helped us, I think, really understand it today and. Uh, what you're seeing is in political terms, this is no longer an issue of one party or another. You saw um, the transition from the Trump administration to the Biden administration. You've seen um, a level of attention from lawmakers across the board that simply wasn't there a few years ago. And so I think there is um, a growing awareness that it's uh, that among people in positions of political power that they don't want this to happen on their watch. And the question is, um, what will happen next? One thing I will also mention to your question, Naomi, about, about um, private corporate role in this. You know, one of the things that I, I hear uh, when I interview people in corporate leadership is they say, well, we will measure a country and its reliability and its legal hygiene on the basis of how it treats people and whether it follows its laws and international laws. And one of the things that people are beginning to say is, if we can't count on China to follow its own laws or follow international law when it comes to questions of protecting human life, um, how can we expect them to be reliable business partners? And I think that's one question that is receiving more attention and I expect it will, um, will probably be significant in the years ahead. And, and um, so that is a, another feature of this that has begun to change through the efforts of, I think the work of Golchera and her colleagues in, in drawing attention to this at a time when it's worth pointing out that this period of escalation of abuse has also been accompanied by a period of dwindling access to the foreign press, to the foreign research community. People from think tanks and from news organizations are finding it increasingly difficult, if not impossible, to access that area, which makes it all, all the more important for people outside the country working on this issue to continue to use the tools at their disposal to draw attention to it. It's a really critical point. It's just been um, a very dramatic shift in terms of just being able to, even as you said, conduct research um, into a number of issues kind of within China. Uh, the increase in awareness is absolutely critical to helping to compel action. And as you noted, corporate sector has an important role to play and may very well be some of the actors that are able to help change behavior. Uh, and it's going to be interesting to see just in the coming months uh, and years what role the corporate sector plays in preventing genocide, not just in, in China, but elsewhere as well as there's a heightened awareness of, of the moral responsibilities that uh, the private sector has, but also that, as we can all understand, uh, commission of genocide is, is bad for business, it's bad for the bottom line. I want to thank all of you for joining us for the conversation, Gulchera, Evan, and Sarita. We very much appreciate your insights. 
the scale of the crimes against the Uyghurs is daunting, and we know that confronting the crimes of a powerful perpetrator will be difficult. And that's precisely why genocide prevention requires a coordinated global response. The Chinese government's crimes cannot be allowed to continue. As was made clear here today, China is failing to uphold its obligation and responsibility to protect its citizens from genocide and crimes against humanity. The Chinese government must stop committing these crimes. The urgency of the situation facing the Uyghurs should be a wake up call to countries around the world to work together to protect the Uyghur population from genocide. I hope that the museum's latest report and the discussion here today will spark this necessary response. For more information about the Uyghurs and to download our report, please visit our website at ushmm.org slash China. Thank you to all of our speakers, to the panelists, and to our audience for joining us today.